All right, folks, how are you doing? So in this video, I'm going to be putting Jade Skeptic's rather dubious claims to further scrutiny. Um, his claims specifically about the likes of the Douglases, the Bruces and the Stewarts being quote unquote foreigners and outsiders who didn't have the best, you know, wishes of the Scots at heart and how they were, I don't know, evil outsiders, I suppose. I mean, it's hard to really get a gauge on his train of thoughts. It's sheer lunacy, really. What it seems to be based on, in my opinion, is a deep-seated inferiority and or persecution complex. You know, um, how the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans are trying to oppress the poor Gaels and Celts, you know, uh, meaning the Scots. But as I've attempted to explain, you know, the Scottish nation... Uh, as in the Kingdom of Scotland, was an amalgamation of about seven different ethnicities. And ethnicities didn't really matter all that much. The people living in the Kingdom of Scotland at the time didn't really pay that much attention to any of this shit. And it didn't really matter to them. But anyway, let's get into the history of Clan Douglas to begin with. So it's described as an ancient Pictish Scottish family. Aha, uh -huh. Pictish Scottish derived from a Gaelic word, dud glass, meaning black stream. Well, this is just one theory, of course, but this whole idea that the Douglases were foreigners and outsiders and all this and trying to oppress the Scots and persecute them when the Picts were in the land of Scotland before the Scots even were. <laughs> you know, their history going to antiquity rivals that of the Britons. They might even be older than the Britons, in fact. Oh, well, what's this we see here? Some claim the name is derived from a knight of 770. This is the century before the Kingdom of Alba was even formed, which became the Kingdom of Scotland, who was aiding King Solvathi Solvathius of Scotland in his great battle with Donald Bain, King of the Western Isles, was granted the lands of Clydesdale. Others claim the name was originally derived from Theobaldus, a Fleming, uh, and were granted the lands of Douglas Water. Well, as with uh, most things historical, it's probably somewhere in between the two. There's probably truth in both those ideas somewhere along the line, but, you know. The surname Douglas was found in Moray, where the progenitor of the clan is thought to be Archibald of Douglasdale. Uh, the Douglases of Drum Landrig claim descent from Sir William Douglas, who was granted the lands in Dum Landrig by King James I in 1412. So this whole point I was making in the original video where I was debunking and rebuking Jed Skeptic yet again, I mean, trying to sweep up, clean up after this guy's bullshit is actually turning into a full-time job. You know, it's not actually something I enjoy doing, believe it or not. But it's disinformation and it needs to be addressed. You know, but the whole thing here, right, by royal decree, the kings are granting the land to the Douglases. They're not worming their way in. They're not backdooring their way in. This is the total opposite of that. If they're being granted land by royal decree, it's the opposite to worming your way in. But, you know, this guy's a combination of stupid and stubborn, which is break out the aspirins, you know, because you're going to have a hell of a headache trying to deal with folk like Jed. You know, the kind of person he is, high emotions and low intellect, honestly. But anyway, the grandson of Archibald Douglas Dale, known as William the Hardy, served as a companion in arms to William Wallace, the great patriot leader of the Scots War of Independence. His two sons, I'll be getting into that in this channel also, like the whole Douglases when they sided with Wallace. Subject for another time though, but his two sons carried on his noble reputation. The first William was the progenitor of the Douglases of Morton and was granted the Earldom of Morton in 1458 by King James II. In other words, here's another branch of Clan Douglas which was given land by the Scottish kings. <laughs> the second Andrew became no the second son Andrew and his family became known as the Black Douglases. I'll get into why that is in later videos. It's not really sub subject for the time being, but you know. So the whole idea of the Douglases being foreigners and outsiders and all this is obviously bullshit <laughs> their name is Gaelic to start with I mean honestly you can rip Jed Skeptic's ridiculous lunacy apart like a tiger ripping apart toilet paper <laughs> it's so easily dismantled 
let's go into what the hell is this get lost anyway let's get into clan bruce and here we see england scotland and ireland because as i brought up um again in the original video to which this is a sequel the bruce clan actually had irish ancestry that's why edward bruce was able to claim the kingship of ireland he wasn't just of norman stock he was also of irish stock as well look into that but anyway the origin of the great scottish surname bruce lay off the british isles as bruce or bruss was a name carried into england in the great wave of migration from normandy following the norman conquest da 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 da, da. we know all this this is not open for debate pretty obvious the surname was found in yorkshire where robert de bruce was granted 94 manors which shows he was highly valued by the way uh, a great fighter, a great lord. His son, Robert de Breas, travelled north with Earl David of Huntington, who later became King of Scotland and was granted large estates in Annandale about 1150. So the Earldom of Huntington and the Earldom of Annandale were given to the Bruces by King David I. They were, you know, appointed to be the lords of the, those lands. Uh, Robert de Bruce had two sons, Robert and William, who became known as Robert the Bruce, who would later become the king and unite us against the English. He defeated the English army at Bannockburn, da 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 da. Of course, we know all this. But the point that's also worth uh, noting is that here he's described as the Bruce of Bannockburn was arguably the most illustrious monarch who ever swayed the Scottish scepter. Well, who said that? Well, a lot of the Scottish nobles did. As a result of this uh, battle, Scotland gained its independence at the Treaty of Northampton in 1328. And this was in the second to last year that uh, Bruce was on the throne. So not only did he claim the Scottish throne, but he earned it through actually gaining independence. I mean, the war was, depending on when you date it back from, either 32 or 42 years. Uh, some date the war back from 1286. Um, I date it back personally from 1296. So we fought England for 32 years. This was a king who was able to end to end a war that lasted more than three decades, incidentally. So that's nothing to take lightly. So he died the next year at Cardross, most likely from leprosy. Uh, he had instructed to one of his most trusted followers, this is the one of the Douglases, to bury his heart in the Holy Land. Uh, and his heart is buried at Melrose in Dunfermline. The reason why he wanted his heart buried in the Holy Land is subject for another time. Uh, but the Treaty of Northampton, Jed's blatantly, of course, overlooking this. You know, the end of the First Scottish War of Independence, the fact that Robert de Bruce not only claimed the Scottish throne, but won Scotland's sovereignty back from England, you know, actually won the war, you know. But let's just overlook all that because it doesn't suit the narrative, you know. Now, the Stuarts, again, England, Scottish, Irish name, so Scottish history is an ex. Oh, how do you say this? Inextricably. There we go. I managed it. Linked to that of the royal clan, Clan Stuart. The surname Stuart was an occupational name for a steward, the official in charge of a noble household and its treasury, which means they were highly trusted. It derives from the old English word sig weird, a compound of sig or household and weird or guardian. As every great house, earl and bishop in medieval England and Scotland had its Stuart. This office was given rise to many lines of this hereditary surname. The surname Stuart was first found in Scotland, where records of Stuart as a surname and not just an occupation were found in the 13th century. Ancestors of the famed royal Stuart line descended from a f family Breton nobles named Flauld. The name is therefore of Anglo-Norman extraction. The name arrived in Britain with Alan, a knight who settled in Oz Westry in Shropshire. So yeah, the word of Anglo-Norman uh, ancestry, there's no doubt about that, and I'm not seeking to deny it either. This is a fact. However, does that mean that they were automatically oppressors of the Scots and um, traitors and enemies? No, not at all, because this was standard practice. After the Normans came across with William the Conqueror, King David sought to bring them into his kingdom for, you know, 
reasons of political expediency, I would suggest. In other words, you didn't want to end up going to war with them. <laughs> now, if we look here at what Wikipedia is saying about Clan Douglas, take their name from Douglas and Lanarkshire. Again, Wikipedia is touch and go in terms of reliability, but I'm just making the overall broader salient points here. So, um, kind of skip down here to the origins. Family surname is thought to derive from the village of Douglas. Again, you know, this is going back so far in history, we don't really know. There's a lot of speculation. You can, you know, there's lots of theories when you go this far back. But the name of which comes from the Gaelic elements, dub meaning dark, and glass meaning stream. Dubglas, dub becomes Douglas. However, according to the 17th century Frederick von Bassen, the Douglas name was first given to Lord Shulton, who was a descendant of the princes of Caledonia. So here's two sources now linking the Douglas to very old times, very ancient times. It means grey hairs in the old language. 1779, William Douglas was Lord of Douglas. He is the first certain record of the name Douglas and undoubtedly the ancestor of the family. He witnessed a charter between 1175 and 1199 by the Bishop of Glasgow to the monks of Kelso. His grandson, Sir William de de Douglas, had two sons who fought at the Battle of Largs in 1263 against the Norsemen. This is before the First Scottish War of Independence, a few decades before, so even... Before Wallace and Bruce, the Douglases are fighting for Scotland against outsiders. They're not outsiders themselves, they're fighting against outsiders. You know. One old tradition is that the first chief of Douglas was Sholto Douglas, who helped the King of Scotland win a battle in the year 767. Uh, this is not substantiated and likely to be pseudo-history. The true progenitor of Clan Douglas was probably Theobaldus Flamatius, Theobald the Fleming, who in 1147 received the lands near Douglas Water in Lanarkshire and returned for services for the abbot of Kelso, who held the barony and lordship of Holydean. The Douglas family names consisted of Archambald and Freskin, who were descended from a Flemish knight. It seems likely that he was the father of the first William Douglas. The Flemish origin of Douglas's has been disputed. Again, when you go that far back, it's probably somewhere between the two. Kind of a combination of both in a way. It has been claimed that the lands which were given to Theobald the Fleming were not the lands from which the Douglas family later emerged. So you're going to have different theories anyway. I mean, that's history when you go back that far. You know, there is... It's kind of hard to corroborate anything 100%. But anyway, uh, Wars of Scottish Independence. Sir William Douglas, the hardy Lord of Douglas, was governor of Berwick-upon-Tweed when the town and Berwick Castle were besieged by the English. So there was a Douglas in charge of Berwick when it was in Scottish hands and was besieged by England. Douglas was captured and released only after he agreed to accept the claim of Edward I to be overlord. He subsequently joined William Wallace uh, we'll get to that when I get back to the book uh, Robin Hood revealed, but was captured and taken to England where he died in 1298. A prisoner in the Tower of London. So these are pro-English Norman oppressors of the Scots who are literally dying in London. <laughs> sure, that makes a whole lot of sense. But anyway, um, William de Handry's son, James Douglas, the good Sir James, 1286 to 1330, was the first to acquire the Epithet. How do you say this? Epithet. Excuse me. The Black. He shared in the early misfortunes of Robert the Bruce. We see all this in Outlaw King. The defeats of Methven and Dalrich in 1306. But for both men, these setbacks proved a valuable lesson in tactics. Again, see Outlaw. The try. Can't talk today. See Outlaw King in Netflix to, you know get the gist of all that. By the time the fighting flared up again in the spring of 1307, they were fighting a guerrilla war, fast moving, lightly equipped. Sir so James Douglas recaptured Roxburgh Castle in 1313 from the English by the way. He was made a knight, baronet and fought at the Battle of Bannockburn. The English called Sir James the Black Douglas 
for what they considered his dark deeds. Um, there was also another theory behind that, but we'll not get into that here. Now, if you look at Clan Bruce, this comes from the French de Bruce or de Bruce. Um, they're thought to be from Bricks and Normandy. There's different versions. Uh, there's no evidence to support a claim that a member served under William the Conqueror. The notion is now believed to have originated unreliably. But both the English and Scots lines of the Bruce family, like I said, Norman families, you know, they were on both sides of the border, demonstrably descend from Robert de Bruce, first Lord of Annandale. Uh, Robert de Bruce was a companion in arms of Prince David, later King David I. In 1124, he followed David North to re reclaim his kingdom, and a civil war broke out in England between Empress Matilda and her cousin Stephen, David I, led a force in England. The Bruce did not follow, and instead joined the English at the Battle of the Standard. He took prisoner his own son. Oh dear, that's not very good, is it? But we're not focused on that particular individual. Foundations of the Royal Line, the foundation for the Bruce Royal Claim came in 1919, uh, sorry, 1219 even I should say, when Robert Bruce, 4th Lord of Annandale, married Isabel of Huntington, daughter of David of Scotland, okay, and she was the niece of William the Lion, so that means that Robert the Bruce, the King Robert the Bruce was descended of two royal kings because William the Lion was also the Scottish king, we can have a look at that very briefly William the first I believe he was King of Scots yep King of Scotland says it right there so Robert de Bruce was descended from at least two Scottish kings the Union brought great wealth with the addition of lands in both England and Scotland their son Robert the Bruce V Lord of Annandale on the death of Alexander both Balliol and Bruce were competing for the throne. Da, da 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 You can kind of look into all this. Soon after the death of young Queen Margaret, and though there's theories that she was poisoned, which um, I would say are probably true, fearing civil war between Bruce and Balliol, the guardians of Scotland asked Edward I to adjudicate. That's not strictly true either. They asked Philip the Fair of France to also intercede. So it wasn't just that they asked King Edward, which would have been downright stupid, <laughs> quite frankly. But um, they also asked the French king to adjudicate as well. It's not written here, but I know that from different sources that I've read. And then it talks about how Balliol rebelled, leading to his defeat after the Battle of Dunbar, which would really be called the Slaughter of Dunbar. So, Jed, you know, before you go talking any more about how King Edward was such a great guy and should have been the king... Uh, over the Bruces and all that sort of thing, looking to the Battle of Dunbar and the Fall of Berwick in 1296. Because the both of them were absolute massacres and they were both won by treachery. But anyway, so with the abdication of John Balliol, they were without a monarch. Robert the Bruce swore allegiance to Edward at Berwick upon Tweed because he basically had no choice if he wanted to get out of there alive, I'd imagine, but breached this oath when he joined the Scottish Revolt the following year. In other words, he just said what he had to say to, you know, leave with his head on top of his shoulders. In the summer of 1297, he swore allegiance at the capitulation at Irving. Bruce appears to have sided with the Scots at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. I haven't found any evidence either way where his loyalty was at that particular time, but given that he knighted his cousin William Wallace only three months later, might, he might have been on Scotland's side at this time. But when Edward returned victorious to England after the Battle of Falkirk, uh, not actually true, but <laughs> we'll talk about that in other videos. Bruce's lands of... That's the official narrative. It's not true. They got their asses handed to them at the Battle of Linlithgow one day later, but subject for another time. Bruce's lands of Annandale and Carrick were exempted from the lordships and lands which Edward assigned to his followers. Very telling line. The reason why this is, is because Robert the Bruce had actually secretly switched sides over to Wallace and Edward kind of knew it. So he was trying to play nice with the Bruce to try and get him back on side again. That was the real reason why that happened. <laughs> yeah. Bruce, it seems, was seen as a man whose allegiance might still be won. In other words, Edward was suspicious. He didn't have proof, but he was suspicious that Bruce had actually gone over 
to Wallace's side. And he was a bit worried about it. Bruce and John Common succeeded Wallace as guardians of Scotland, but their rivalry threatened the stability of the country. And hang on, I need to take a quick break. I'll be back in a minute. Sorry about that. But anyway, so I was talking about, um, you know, Wallace was no longer guardian. So then, yep. Bruce and John Common became the guardians. Try to find where I left off. Yep, the um, I meeting mean, was arranged at Greyfriars Church in Dumfries. Bruce stabbed Common through the heart. We'll talk about that in other videos, why that was. He was excommunicated by Pope Clement V. However, he was crowned king at Schoon in 1306. After this, um, you get the events of Outlaw King. Just go watch that. Um, yeah, because that's basically the compressed timeline of all what's being described here. Or you can go read this article. Um, but anyway, so then it kind of talks about how Robert the Bruce led the Scots to victory at the Battle of Bannockburn in uh, 1314. So that covers that. Now, the point I want to get to here is the Declaration of Arbroath in 1320. And this is from the National Records of Scotland. This is a government website. There's a few things to point out here. The Declaration was planned at a meeting of the King and his council at New Battle Abbey, just south of Edinburgh, in March 1320. Arguments uh, were presumably made then for the barons to seal the letter, written in Latin, on sheepskin. And the declaration emphasises Scotland's long history as an independent Christian kingdom. Now the point that's worth illustrating here is that even with the influx of the Normans during the Davidian Revolution, Scotland remained Scotland, pretty much. You know, an independent Christian kingdom. The Anglo-Saxons and the Normans did not take over this country. They assimilated into it and fought for it. It contains a brief account of the mythical origins of the Scots. They'd overcome many difficulties in their journey from Greater Scythia to the north of the Black Sea via Spain to Scotland. And it's interesting when you watch Outlaw King how, you know, uh, Robert the Bruce says, I'm king of Scots, not the king of the land, but the people. Interesting. Which includes the, you know, seven ethnicities I've talked about before. Britons, Normans, Norse, Gaels, Saxons, um, Picts. And there's one I'm forgetting. Dariada, Scots. Anyway, it explains that they had lived in freedom and peace until King Edward I invaded Scotland and caused widespread havoc. So... It wasn't the Saxons and the Normans coming in to Scotland and being granted lands by the kings that caused any disruption. You know, it was King Edward the First Plantagenet, who was Norman, yes, but also the King of England. There were Normans on both sides. You know, it's kind of this third faction in the background. The Declaration asserts that the Scots were saved by their present king, Robert the Bruce, whom they will defend as their king unless he seeks to make their kingdom subject to the English king. And the Pope is asked to persuade England, Edward even the second, to leave the Scots in peace. Very interesting. The declaration was set in the names of eight earls and 31 barons. It implies that all Scots were steadfast in their support of Robert I as king. So it's worth paying close attention to this. By the time of 1320, the Scots were very firmly behind King Robert I. He wasn't seen as an outsider or a foreigner, quote-unquote, or anything like that. He was seen as their victorious king. Of course, it's saying here, in reality, that support was not universal, obviously because of what he did to John Common. The majority of the barons uh, named in the declaration were Robert I's loyal supporters, but not all of them. You know, And it goes on about how he was never completely solidified across the board. And you can go read this, but certainly the majority of the Scottish nobles, and some of them, like I've said, would be Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Norman, you know, in origin. Um, even they were behind, you know, Robert I. Even Robert himself was 
half Norman. But anyway, moving on to Clan Stuart. Okay, so it's a Scottish Highland and Lowland clan. Um, so let's go to the origins. The Stuarts, who became the monarchs of Scotland, were descended from a family who were Seneschals, stewards of Dol in Brittany and France. After the Norman conquest, the Stuarts acquired estates in England as the Fitzalan family, also earls of Arundel. Uh, da, 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 came to Scotland when King David I of Scotland claimed his throne. It is from their office as stewards that the name Stuart came. So they started off as servants to the kings before they actually became the kings, it would seem like. Walter was created High Steward of Scotland and was granted large estates in Renfrewshire and East Lothian. Again, very important word, granted. In other words, David I gave him these lands by royal decree. He was appointed to these lands. It's the opposite to backdooring your way and then sneaking in and all that sort of thing. The paranoid, delusional, you know, perspective of Jed Skeptic. Anyway, Walter was one of the commanders of the Royal Army which defeated Summerled of the Isles at the Battle of Renfrew, or Renfrew in 1164. So he was a high commander in the Scottish Royal Army. Again, you know, you have to earn your keep when you're given these appointments and these positions and lordships and things like that. In the Scottish Norwegian War, Alexander Stuart, 4th High Stuart of Scotland, also known as Alexander of Dundonald Castle, commanded the Scottish army at the Battle of Largs in, in 1263. I think this was the same uh, battle that I mentioned earlier on, Largs, where uh, the Douglases were involved. So we had the Douglases and the Stuarts fighting for the Kingdom of Scotland against the Vikings, you know, before the First Scottish War of Independence. But, you know, let's not let that get in the way of the narrative. During the Wars of Independence, James Stuart Firth, sorry, Fifth High Stuart of Scotland swore fealty to Edward I. However, he later sided with Robert the Bruce and William Wallace in the struggle for Scottish independence. And here it goes into uh, Walter Stuart, Sixth High Stuart of Scotland, married Marjorie, daughter of King Robert the Bruce. When Robert's son, David II, died, he was succeeded by Walter Stewart's son, Robert II. Uh, he had many sons. So the, the Stewarts progressively, over time, made their way onto the throne. It didn't just happen, like, overnight with a coup d'etat or anything like that. You know, they earned their place, fighting in a number of wars against the Norse and against the English. Very interesting. But there was one particular uh, Stuart that I wanted to focus on, and that was Sir John Stuart. And I mentioned him uh, in the original video in this series where I was debunking Jed Skeptic. I talked about Sir John Stuart leading the Scots at the Battle of Falkirk. See, so it says here, died on 22nd of July 1298, the brother of Sir James V, High Stuart of Scotland. Uh, a Scottish Knight and military commander. Uh, saying um, about his biography, he was the uncle of James Douglas. The shores of the Douglases were in tight with each other, that much is certainly true. But when you get down to his career here, as a Baron of Scotland, Sir John participated in governmental affairs, including confirmation of the Treaty of Salisbury, and was among those requesting Edward I of England to certify the papal dispensation to permit the marriage of his son Edward II to Margaret of Norway. They are presumptive to the Scottish throne after the death of her grandfather Alexander III of Scotland. After the tragic death of Margaret of Norway, the forced abdication of John Belial, the English invasion of Scotland in 1296, John's relations with Edward I soured and he came to support the Scottish cause against the English occupation. A letter from 1297. Now pay attention to this part. This is where you really need to be looking close. Indicates that Edward I of England considered Sir John, along with his brother Sir James, the steward of Scotland, and Sir Robert the Bruce, the Earl of Carrick, as the primary threats to his rule in Scotland. In the letter he charges the English treasurer in Scotland, Sir Hugh de Cressingham, to employ all the skill he has with the funds provided him to capture them to end the insurrection. So this totally 
debunks, obliterates, destroys Jet Skeptic's paranoid narrative about the Shures being foreigners and traitors. Yeah, were they foreigners initially in terms of coming from, you know, Norman lineage, from, from being from the north of Europe, from France and all the rest of it? Yes, initially they were. But that, you're talking about several hundred years ago by the time that the Scottish Wars of Independence roll around, have integrated into the Kingdom of Scotland and they are serving the Kingdom of Scotland to the point that the King of England is putting them on a hit list. This guy's a major threat. So how can they be traitors and all this sort of thing and uh, oppressing the Scots and the poor downtrodden uh, Scots who are helpless and can't do anything and yet, you know, Edward I is so pissed at them. He's such a threat to his rule on the side of Scotland that he's writing to Hugh de Cressingham telling him he's number one on your hit list. You know, doesn't make any sense. On July 22nd, 1298, the Feast of St. Mary Magdalene, the English army under Edward I discovered the Scottish host led by William Wallace and attacked. We'll talk about the Battle of Falkirk elsewhere. It didn't exactly happen as described here, but that's neither really here nor there. The point is that, you know, Sir John Stuart was one of the commanders. As in here, Sir John Stuart, the brother of the Steward of Scotland, commanded the Scottish archers. And Sir William Wallace commanded the infantry. John Comyn commanded the, the cavalry. And it's saying that, you know, Sir John Stuart perished in this battle. You know, he fought for the Scots, alongside the Scots, and died on the side of Scotland. And after the battle, Sir John Stuart was buried in the churchyard of the Falkirk Old Parish Church. It's probably the same site, in fact, where uh, Sir John the Graham, another Norman, incidentally, or man of Norman uh, lineage, was also buried with great honour. Saying after falling from his horse, the archers rallied around the body of their fallen lord and were killed to the man. So what does that tell you? You know, all the Scots who were fighting for Sir John Stuart, fighting under him, rallied around his body to try and protect it. Would they do that if he was a so-called, you know, foreigner who was oppressing them? You know, think a little bit about these things before you come out and see these things. But there you go. I think a thoroughly, absolutely obliterated Jed Skeptic's ridiculous arguments yet again. Um, like I said, at this point, it has become a full-time job. So hopefully you've learned a thing or two. And uh, don't listen to his paranoid rantings because they're usually utter bullshit. And they can be very easily dispunct. Dispunct? Sorry. <laughs> I don't think that's even a word. They can very easily be disproven and debunked I think that's what I was trying to say but the two words got muddled up in my mouth <laughs> but yeah they can be disproven and debunked and obliterated very easily with even a cursory glance at uh, even the most superficial of evidence anyway thanks for watching